day in Manhattan Clear as could be Till the planes hit the buildings And changed history They stood for an hour Once the damage was done But then suddenly crumbled Ten seconds they were gone There were cascading projections of steel into dust it Looked like explosions but it was not discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion Right in front of my eyes Well, I'm not scared of dying We're all bound for heaven I'm Just sharing the truth About 9-11 Now building number seven Drop the cleanest of all Yet the world still knows nothing Of this amazing free fall There was no real reason It wasn't hit by a plane They say it was a fire And yet you can't see the flames You see cascading Projections of steel into dust Looks like demolition But it's never discussed So I turn off the TV And shut out the lights It's all just illusion Right in front of my eyes Well, I'm not scared of dying They say that the bigger the lie, the more people believe And the deeper the fear, the more easily we are deceived Turn off the TV And I shut out the lies It's all just illusion They're right in front of my eyes Sharing the truth About 9-11 Yes, I'm sharing the truth About 9-11 Okay, hi, this is Bill Olson, and you're looking at my show, 9-11 was an inside job. Oh, yeah, hey, i got to turn this audio off. That's how good I am. I don't have everything set up. I'm the only one here. We just had a, uh, a death in the family, if you want to call it that. One of our original uh, producers, Carl Connor, did a show called the full gospel sea beers for the last 24 years and he died Sunday and I went to the funeral today actually the the celebration of his life and the rest of the crew and everybody else is still there I had to come back so I could do this and it's, it's not a happy day but this gives you an example have you ever wanted to make a TV show of your own did you know that Portland Community Media will train you and then give you free airtime? Well, every month they have an introductory class. So call up Portland Community Media and sign up 
for the introductory class and see how you like it. You can be a producer. And here I'm doing the show basically by myself. I've got a sound man, Ed. And uh, anyway, you get to see me make all the mistakes that go on behind the scenes. I've got a, a number of videos and interesting things to show you today. Uh, first of all, David Chandler just released yesterday a brand new video from uh, a recent talk he gave in front of college students and uh, I gotta set that up right now so let me do that uh, you gotta use the right keyboard here it comes let's see let me step up to the far enough ahead yeah okay give me some audio and we'll switch right over What's and I'll be on. back in a little bit. Okay. What we've seen is this simple observation that the, t that the top of the building is accelerating downward through the lower section of the building has the implication that the building is being demolished. And we see the rapid onset because the tower is first and all out. We figure all the core columns have been cut. It, all of them, all 47 of them it sure looks like explosives were used. Now, if you have some indication that explosives were used, that would lead you then to look for evidence. Do we see evidence of explosives? Um, because of the fact our theory, I mean our analysis, is pointing in that direction, you would think that you would follow up and uh, actually look for it, right? So let's look for it. I'm not sure how many slides behind I am. Oh, here's another one of those. Okay, let's look for it. Now, look what's happening here. I want you to pay attention right in here. See what's happening? I'm going to start this one again. Let's back up. Okay. Look right in here. You see what's happening? You see that up here is where the nominal collapse plane is, if that's what's happening. But way down here below, you see stuff blowing continuously. A wave, okay, a massive I, I kind of toast outward a, flow. A bad of example uh, where he was far below and the point and where so, the nominal but bear with collapse us and I'll, is. I'll come current. back in a minute. But this video is you can see uh, an hour and a 49 and then, minutes long, so you look for it, uh, and then you don't rationalize it somewhere away. and view it for yourself. But once you recognize that channel, it's to be expected in the analysis, out.org. then you look at it and you see that it is actually there. That becomes a very reasonable interpretation of what you're seeing. People who don't want to see that happening, of course, will rationalize it away. I missed what's going on here. Well, look at that. Look at all that stuff coming out. You see that? All through here. I wanna, I'm going to do this one again. Here, I'm going to start it from scratch. And just... Okay, so first you have this wave. Now, see all these up here? These little puffy point ejections? The common explanation... No, squibs, they call them. The common explanation for those, oh, there's pressure built up on those floors and you're seeing air pressure pushing this out. But notice this wave of, this massive wave of destruction of the walls. You've opened up all these walls. How do you get a piston to build up tremendous pressure in a, in a, building, <clears throat> in a building where you've already blown out the walls? You know, it's an open environment in there. It's not anything where you can compress the air like that. So that doesn't make sense. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. So up in here, we're seeing what clearly must be explosions. And then down here is this lower one we saw from that other angle. OK? And here's up close. And it's there to be seen if you look for it. And not just one or two. The big difference between Bazan's simplified block model and direct observation is there is no evidence that the top block even survived past the first few seconds. Looks like the top block was the first thing to be demolished. 
If we are not preconditioned to censor our direct perceptions, it would appear both from analysis and observation that we are witnessing a demolition, not a crush down. I have a paper spelling all this out in the Journal of 9-11 Studies. Uh, North, I think it's called uh, North Tower in Fundamental Physics or something like that. Uh, I have, by the way, all of these papers, everything I'm going to mention tonight, I have links to them from my website, 911speakout.org. Uh, go there and do a lot of browsing. Okay. There's an earlier paper also in the Journal of 911 Studies by Graham McQueen and Tony Zambodi. Tony Zambodi is an incredible mechanical engineer back in New Jersey. I've had the pleasure of working with him on some of this stuff. And they did an earlier paper that was from a more intuitive starting point, but they came, it's equally valid, and they come to the same conclusion. And as they call it, where's the jolt? Or the missing jolt. Like, if you had something that hits something, when they hit, there's a jolt, right? It's sort of like this, the same thing as my F equals MA analysis here. That if this were actually colliding with the bottom section of the building, and inflicting some kind of a excess force like that, it would create a jolt. But you don't observe that jolt because it never happened. By not, talk, by not talking about the details of the collapse, this was a, I mean, my speculation, the reason they didn't want to even talk about it was they're trying to not lie in the sense of perjury. They don't want to get caught up in court having told blatant lies. So when they get to the point here and elsewhere, I'm going to hopefully illustrate somewhere else in the paper here. When they get to the point where they pretty much have to lie, what they do is they talk gibberish. I'm not kidding. They use concepts that make no sense. It's very hard to parse what it is they're saying, and I'll give you another illustration of that later on. Here, what they did was they just didn't go there. They said, as soon as they, as soon as they have this wall going in, they say, aha, there's a failure. It must mean there's a failure of the cores. We have initiation. We're done. I'm, I'm bringing it back okay. now uh, so we can get on to some other videos, but uh, I'm just about done editing the 30-minute video that, uh, we did with David Chandler here in the studio several months back, and we're, I'm finishing it up finally. It's amazing how much detail work it takes when you actually do it, not live like we're doing here. But uh, so keep your eye out for that. And uh, like last week, I introduced you to Dr. Steve Pachenik's website, drstevetalks.com. Yeah, dot com. And uh, now I'm going to introduce you to Michael Parenti. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's a historian, an economist. Uh, uh, well, uh, basically a, a rational socialist. You, you need to. I agree with just about everything he says, and I wish that it was a more common dialogue. I'll let you judge for yourself, but let me uh, bring up this video here. I just happened to have it ready. This is from a, a video called um, the the one percent mythology and the uh, and the uh, the myth of capitalism. Okay, <laughs> so let me let me go ahead and start this up. Oh wait wait a minute, this is the wrong one. That's the one that echoes. This one is a little earlier one and. We'll have this thing here on the screen. So let me start it. It's up here at five minutes. Sorry, but this is what happens when you don't have a crew. OK, I think that should be going about right. Go, value go added. Bring up the sound. The, the technical term actually is added value, value added in manufacture. And they will talk about you invest a dollar in Ohio, you get a value added of three dollars. You invested in Indonesia, you get a value added of, of eleven dollars. So let's move to Indonesia uh, for the jobs, with the cheaper and such. <clears throat> this is what this is how the slave owner could live in such opulence 
He had slaves who worked and produced this opulence for him and consumed very little of it. This is how the lord of the manor could live in such opulence. He had serfs who worked and toiled hard for him and consumed but a small portion of it while the rest went to him. And this is the way the plutocrat and the corporate private capitalist investor also gets wealthy by underpaying workers. What I'm, what I'm suggesting is that great wealth creates poverty. It creates poverty. As wealth has grown, so has poverty. The number of people living in poverty today is growing at a faster rate than the world's population. Even, even as the number of billionaires is growing at a dramatic rate also. And it's not just poverty. You don't have to be below the poverty level to feel the effects, to experience the stress and scarcity of a ruthlessly profit-driven corporate economy. You can be a normal working person, even someone with a fairly decent income, and there still could be cutbacks in pay, speed-ups, loss of seniority, loss of benefits including health insurance, temporary unemployment from downsizing, long-term unemployment, runaway housing costs, involuntary job relocations, and the like, and on and on. You could add your own list. In the last 30 years in the United States, ladies and gentlemen, there has been a remarkable growth in technological productivity and a remarkable creation of material wealth, yet wages and salaries have remained flat and sh have shown only a slight growth. So the gap between capital and labor is increasing. Economic inequality has increased considerably since 1978. Now this picture of competitive inequality, wealth creating poverty, is seriously, hugely at variance with the accepted ideology of capitalism, which says that as the pie gets bigger, we all get a bigger slice. One of those great, one of the great theorists of modern capitalism, um, one of the great minds in the American mainstream media, Rush Limbaugh, said, <laughs> said, it isn't zero sum, it's more for all of us. And he repeated that old axiom that you hear, a rising tide lifts all boats. What well, do you know Parenti's axiom? It is a rising tide drowns many people. It is zero sum. It is. More for the landlords means less disposable income for the renters. More for the owners means less for the workers. And conversely, the other way around. More for the worker means less for the owner. If I, as an owner, has to spend money on stupid, ridiculous things like wage increases, occupational safety, environmental protection, pensions, the more I have to spend on those kind of things, every dollar I got to spend on that is one less dollar for me. It is so zero sum. Oh man, do they think it's zero sum all the time. All of this is also at variance with the established ideology that capitalism creates prosperity, not poverty. Look at North America. Look at capitalist North America. Look at the remarkable prosperity. Look at the remarkable prosperity of capitalist Western Europe. The capitalist countries are the prosperous ones. Uh-huh. That's a very selective view of capitalism, isn't it? Could I invite you to look at capitalist countries? Look at capitalist Nigeria and capitalist Mexico and capitalist Philippines and capitalist Thailand, El Salvador, Bolivia, and go on with another hundred or so countries where children live in disease and illiteracy and poverty and malnutrition. Those are capitalist countries. They're never thought of or discussed in that way. But they are really pure capitalist countries. They're capitalist countries where democracy has not made any inroads in the class struggle to speak of. Most of the world is capitalist and getting more capitalist. And most of the world is poor and getting poorer. The third world is not underdeveloped. It's overexploited. It's underdevelopment... <clears throat> It's underdevelopment and immense poverty in shanty towns are not an original historical condition. These people know how to fish. 
They don't need you to come in with your technical advice. They need access to the shorelines and the web, and they need nets and, and boats to fish. They know how to farm. They need land. They know how to work. They need workable, decent-paying jobs. Let's return to the U.S. Who are the wealthy in the United States? Well, we hear it's the top 20%. The top quintile, the wealthiest quintile, or the top 20%, the top fifth, are the wealthy. Whenever they discuss these things and they say, incomes are getting more unequal because 20 years ago, the top fifth was making 12 times more than the bottom fifth. And now, the top fifth is making 14 times more than the bottom fifth. Well, let's stop playing with those kind of silly statistics, okay? The top fifth, to be in the top fifth, all you have to make is $65,000 a year. And you're in the top fifth. So you're one of the rich? No. hundred thousand. If you make 100000 100000 is a very nice salary in this country. I've never seen it. But um, 100000 you would be in the top 4% in the country. That doesn't make you rich. You're not the rich. You can be snuffed out of your job, and people who are making 100 k have experienced that. I've also read one place that in the last 20 years, the top 20% increased their income by $27,000 in 20 years. What is that? This, is, this has nothing to do with wealth. Let's talk about real wealth. Let's talk about that fraction of 1% that owns the lion's share of everything in this society that there is to own. When I talk about wealth, I'm talking about the Morgans and the Mellons and the Murdochs, the Huntingtons, the Harrimans, the Hunts, the Rockefellers and DuPonts, the Bill Gateses and the Warren Buffetts, and the Waltons. Don't forget the Waltons. Uh, there's four of them every year when they show America's richest people. There are these four, and they, each of them got $20 billion each. They're the ones who own Walmart. Walmart. And they, and they got so rich with remarkable technological innovations such as working middle-aged women at entry-level wages and working them in, with no overtime, working them so they couldn't, can't even afford a, a place to live. Half of them live out of their vans or double up with their mothers or whatever else. Or, or daughters, etc. The spread between the Waltons and the bottom fifth is not 12 to 1 or even 14 to 1. The spread is more like 80,000 to 1. Do the numbers. Okay. <clears throat> now it's at this point, or really much earlier than this point, that we hear someone come in and start to talk about mom and pop capitalism. The small business that somebody starts and he hires some people and they work for him and he creates jobs and they perform service. It's usually done in this nostalgic, sentimental way. The entrepreneurial ethic of going out there with an idea and doing this and he struggles hard. I'm not today talking about the entrepreneurial mythology, okay? I'm talking about the transnational monopoly finance capital reality. Mom and pop small businesses are not calling the tunes. They are the squirrels that dance among the elephants. Lenin was right when he said 10 million small businesses count for nothing. A few giant cartels count for everything. What do you mean? A squirrels dancing, by the way, squirrels dancing among elephants have a, a very low life expectancy. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and hundreds of mom-and-pop businesses get stamped out. Hundreds get stamped out every week. Well, don't they make a modest contribution? No, they don't make a modest contribution. They make a huge contribution. All the net, all the net increase in jobs in this economy comes from small and medium-sized businesses or from the public sector. All the net increase in jobs, the net increase in new jobs, the net growth, the net growth in jobs after you count for downsizing, outsourcing, layoffing, hiring new people, opening a factory here but closing one there, and all the net increase contributed by corporate America is zero, zilch, nada. Let's let's look at the Waltons again. What is it? What is the imperative that propels wealthy individuals? 
I mean multi-billionaires we're talking about, and their wealthy corporate financial organizations. What is it, what is it that makes Sammy run? It's the desire, the dedication, nay, even the necessity to accumulate still more wealth. As Marx said in Volume 1, accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. You've got to get more. Why? Why would people who have billions of dollars, who have more money than they know what to do with, who have more money than they could spend in utter opulence and luxury in ten lifetimes, why do they go out there to make still more, as if their crust of bread depended on it? There are several reasons, I think. First, I really do believe that wealth is addictive, that the haves become the have-mores, and the have-mores want to become the have-it-alls. There's only one thing that every plutocratic class in every society throughout history has ever wanted, and that's everything. All the best herds, all the best lands, all the best resources, all the civilities and comforts and services of civil society while paying none of the costs. They want it all. They have a lot, they can get more, and they want it all. So this is the way it goes. Fortune whets the appetite for more fortune. You can't take it with you, but in a way you can. There was a corny comedian back in the 50s, very popular then, TV comedian named Milton Berle. Many of you, many, I can see many of the students here have never, never <laughs> seen Milton Berle. You've never seen Milton Berle perform. Consider yourself lucky. But, um, but he did say one thing which I thought was, is very apropos. He once, one of his jokes was, he says, if I can't take it with me, I'm not going. And, and, there's, and there's something of the psychology in this, in, 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 the very, in, the very, in the very rich plutocrats. The thought of breaking up your estate, for instance, breaking up your estate into four smaller parts to give to your four children, is just more than you can bear. You build this empire. Estates are things that you add to. You don't subtract and cut them up. You build this empire. You want it to be kept together. Not only that, it's dangerous for the family's standing and the family's name to break it up into smaller estates and little, and little things. So for its standing, this estate has to stand. And so the, there was this curious invention called primogeniture, where everything, all the family fortune and wealth was given to the oldest son. And the younger sons had to make do with uh, top echelon appointments in the church or the government or the military. And the daughters, hopefully they could marry well or be sent off to the nunnery. So, in a way, you are keeping all this wealth. You're not, not quite taking it with you, but you are immortalizing it to secure the family name and fortune, though not necessarily the well-being of all family members. Another reason for relentless accumulation is less psychological and more systemic, and it has to do with the corporate capitalist system itself which requires constant expansion, even in a monopolistic oligopoly with a few corporate giants that dominate a field and, and, and mergers are the rule. And you know, today you see, you, we see now mergers. You don't see a giant corporation swallowing up smaller companies. You see giant corporations swallowing another giant corporation. I mean, Chevron and Texaco and, you know, Unical and Union Carbide. I mean, huge things cannibalizing each other. So even in this monopolistic corporate cartel capitalism, it's a constantly insecure and indeterminate feel. Markets change, new competitors with new technologies enter the fray, investments backfire. To remain in one place, to remain with one segment of the market is to lose ground, not just competitively, but eventually absolutely. Those companies in New England that stayed purely regional, nobody remembers their names today for the most part, unless it's a, a, a particular service industry that's fixed in a particular region for certain, for certain reasons. Another reason for accumulation is that wealth, even great wealth, is never totally or absolutely secure. How do you protect what you have from the following kinds of dangers? Wealth can get expropriated. It can get plundered by competing forces, by revolution, insurrection, invasion, looting, it could be lost through devaluation or failure to reify or realize its value. What if all my money is in Confederate bonds? 
and the Confederacy loses the Civil War, there were people this happened to. A whole class, in effect, was snuffed out, although they actually kept control of most of their land. But they lost immense amounts of capital. This capital happened to be in the form of human beings. Hundreds of millions of dollars in capital uh, with the emancipation of slaves. Also, remember, the key instrument to finance capital is money. I was taught in school that money is a medium of exchange. And that has a very nice, neutral-sounding tone to it. Money can be used for good. It can be used for bad. You can use it to build a hospital or bribe an official or, uh, or, or bomb a village. But money, historically, in class society, becomes a means of abstracting and mobilizing and accumulating wealth. It gives fluidity and, and abstraction and mobility to wealth. In the olden days, when wealth consisted principally of land and castles and crops and herds and furs and maybe some gold cups and silver plates or whatever else, you could accumulate just so much. But abstracted from material wealth, money becomes a powerful tool for accumulation. So in the world of rich and poor, there's nothing neutral about money. Money is an invention for the rich. It doesn't serve the poor. It's the same kind of, same kind of gibberish you hear about technology. Technology is a neutral thing. Technology could be used for good or it could be used for bad. No, but technology is created and formed in a social context, in a class structural context. And most of the technology that we see being developed is for the powers that be. In fact, government, government technology, when you think about it, almost all of it is for surveillance, communication, and destruction, and control. That's that pretty much what the government involved I mean, the government doesn't invent egg beaters or, or you know, useful things like that, does it? Uh, so wealth can take a, a liquid abstract form through money. Financial capital in general, uh, it, it, be, it ta assumes this liquid form if we, if we would. Material wealth takes an immaterial form. It's a kind of odd development. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have $5,000 in the bank or $5 million in the bank. Um, the, these are, you, the money isn't really there. I mean, that money isn't there. What, what you have is some numbers on an account. It's been abstracted. Um, that money's gone elsewhere. The bank would only take your money only if it can get rid of it, that is, lend it out to someone else at a larger interest than it's paying you. You have bonds. Well, look at your bonds a little more closely. Take one of your bonds and go down to the supermarket and see what you could buy with it. Nobody will take your bonds. Nobody will honor your bonds. Your bonds are IOUs. That's what they are from somebody. If a disaster was to hit our society, seriously damaging its productive facilities and killing many people who are the real source of wealth with their labor and such, and the, and the environment with its resources, the money you have recedes into its present material form, namely numbers in an account. I mean, literally, it's material form, which is an immaterial thing. Numbers, abstracted numbers. So you need constantly to have productive forces and markets. Okay. You know, it's really refreshing to hear a description that does not conflict with your own experience. So often they tell you stories that, you know, no matter how you twist and turn it, it does not fit. You just have to acquit. Oh, sorry for you. <laughs> History, history buffs will know what that reference was. Well, anyway, um, we got... Uh, I don't remember if, for sure if I played the uh, winning entry and the runner-ups for the Alex Jones Make Fun of the TSA contest. Uh, a $10,000 prize was just awarded. I'm going to play the, the winner of that contest right now. It's called, uh, well, what is, what is it called? <laughs> I want to get it right. Control. If, if I can. Anyway, uh, let's see. It's called Dick Johnson. It's it's like a '70s, you know, the name of a '70s TV show. But we'll let her play here.
Now, Mrs. Johnson, there's really no easy way to put this. Your son's a turd. He cheats, he lies, he steals, he's failing all his classes, he's a sexual predator. This kid has no place in this school. Now, I care about him, okay? But at some point, you're going to have to sit there and ask yourself, what's he going to do with his life? He's not fit for society. He's out of control. Oh, come on, Mr. Weissman. There's got to be something this kid can do with his life. Well, Richard? Huh? What do you want to do with your life? cabin yeah we got feedback when we're controlling the audio where we're generating it and listening to it at the same time okay uh, I'm, I'm gonna play the next one here uh, let's see here where the heck is it oh trendy that's this is another one this this is a good one here I, it was a kind of a toss-up the one you just saw was the ten thousand dollar winner and this is one of the runner-ups hard to choose How are you doing today? We'll ask the questions around here, Mr. Domestic Terrorist. Hey. Do you own any guns? Yes. Racist. That is so racist. FEMA camp. What, so I can't go through then? Oh, no, no. We want you to go through. Yeah, we got a x-ray and a pat-down waiting for you. Hey, this is against the Fourth Amendment. No, it isn't. No, it's not, because Al-Qaeda might be hiding up your butt. We gotta search. We gotta search your racist butt. We gotta search. It's for your safety, racist. You're just lucky that we haven't installed our detention pods at this here airport yet, or we would capture your racist Al-Qaeda hiding domestic terrorist butt. Pack down! Have a nice flight. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, how trendy. Ma'am, you're going to need to take off your shoes and we're going to need to see some ID. I'm sorry, I, I, is there anything? Oh, ma'am, I'm afraid we're gonna need to see some ice cream. Just beat me, I, just beat me hard. I, I worship your authority. You know, during the economic collapse, I don't think you're gonna make it, okay? Okay. Jellyfish. Have a nice flight. Thank you. Oh, Tootsie, we've been waiting for you all day. What? We're just going through metal detectors, right? <laughs> Tough guy, come here. We are going to caress, I mean inspect your lady here. But don't worry, we'll use the backs of our hands and be very gentle with the sensitive areas. And you expect to catch terrorists by doing this? No. You see, it's not about catching terrorists. It's about conditioning the slaves. You see, it's going to right for the masters to put their hands on the slaves and take pictures of them naked. Hence, the TSI. She's not a slave. Or I am not a Shh. slave. Do you have a credit card debt? Yes. Mortgage? Uh-huh. Car payment? Yeah. Yeah, and let's not forget uh, the whole national debt. So, because gold is the money of kings, silver is the money of nobles, barter is the money of peasants, and debt is the money of slaves. Touching. Slaves. And what about the First Amendment? I can't even joke. No, no, no. See, that's for the slaves. We can joke all we want. Yeah, because here in the Banana Republic of Los Estados Unidos, the joke is on you. See here, bear with me. Um, let's see if I can find it. Here we go. This one's called "The TSA is now hiring." By the way, I've used that line many times on the blogs on YouTube when some idiot is just being an oppressive bastard. You know, well, excuse my language, but I won't change. Here we go. I don't care if he's in a wheelchair, stand him up. Hello, I'm Richard Reed. You can call me Dick. Are you having trouble finding a job without a diploma or GED? Are you an unemployed, defrocked priest? Do you enjoy making children cry? Have you ever wanted to take an old man's pants off in public? Or are you simply tired of jobs that require you to think? If you answered yes to any of those questions, then we here at TSA may have the exciting new career opportunity that you've been waiting for. Can you sit up? Sit up. Slam to the floor. But if you touch my junk, I'm gonna have you arrested. With a base salary of $15 an hour, our employees enjoy perks you won't find anywhere else. Naps, half hour long bathroom breaks, and little to no supervision whatsoever. Plus, all the free water, shampoo, and grandma's applesauce you can handle. At TSA, we're dedicated to America and Americans. And in 10 plus years, we haven't caught a single terrorist. With a 0% success rate, we have nowhere to go but up. Help us help you. Apply online at www.infowars.com today. TSA, fondling millions of genitals every day. For your safety. 
safety. Millions of genitals a day. Yeah, you can apply now. And like I say on the blogs, just mention my name. I'll be your character reference. Okay, uh, and I don't understand. You see right here, it wasn't supposed to be playing two of them at once, side by side. I, that's just what happens when you... Uh, use consumer electronics instead of broadcast quality. What? I didn't say that. Okay, well, um, let's see. Now what I've got here is, uh, yeah, the North Tower. This is just going to be a, a, a visual. I'm going to tell you about it here. Don't, don't put up the audio. Okay, now see, See the explosions popping out of the very corner of the building? It'll be repeating here in just a second. And, uh, yeah, you can see right, right here again. That's popping out where there are no windows, just steel beams. Uh, the idea that it's a, a, a bellows-type collapse as one floor falls down and pressurizes, well, you might convince somebody of that somewhere about one floor but take a look here you, well i can't point okay over here just watch what you not only have explosions along the edge but you have them down below you know up and down the side of the building by 20 stories once you blow out the walls on the top how on earth do you pressurize the bottom to continue blowing your stuff out here i'll let you watch it so you know if it was just one floor at a time, that's one thing, but you, you notice that it's spread over 20 or 30 floors, which means that it's not a pressurized thing. Those are individual explosions just blowing the heck out of that building. And the more you look at it, the more I wonder, how on earth can anybody believe that they're not explosions? It's just impossible to believe. This is from, well, as you saw, the David Chandler video. Uh, he put several, this is from his uh, DVD, the analysis DVD uh, that he made for architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Well, let's see, we got 10 minutes left. Maybe I can find something worth doing here. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. That Michael Parenti thing was so good. I'm going to go back to where we left off and play some more of that. And that way I, I don't have to go through it. I don't feel like talking to anybody on the phone right now. Death in the family, you know. Okay, well, so we'll just play Michael Parenti until we're gone. And we'll have some 9-11 news uh about lawsuits and other uh, adventures. There, you know, if the, if the buildings really collapsed because of some design flaw, then by golly, don't you think it would be a good idea to let everybody know that they have to change all the future designs so that that won't happen again? Funny that they didn't think of that when they were developing this official story and then saying, no, 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 keep doing what you're doing. So anyway, we'll go ahead and play Michael Parenti while you dwell on that. To the rich man's bright lodge. We had <clears throat> children not going to school, hardly any public education to speak of, public services. And family aid consisted of a few soup kitchens in the back of churches, and that was it. It took a century of struggle to get us to the point where, where, where we live at a somewhat better level. A century of democratic struggle reigning in and containing the forces of free market plutocracy. This same free market plutocracy, by the way, isn't so free market when it comes to themselves. While they preach to you the virtues of self-reliance, Stop going to the government for a handout. Rely on yourself and your own efforts. 
they themselves got their hands in the public treasury, right? I mean, they've got their arms right up to their elbows in the public treasury. They themselves get equity subsidies from the federal government. They get loan guarantees. They get export subsidies. They get research and development assistance. They get production loss compensations. They get bailouts only for the giants. Mom and pop does, doesn't get bailed out. If you got your little business and you go under, you go under. Goodbye. But if you're Chrysler Corporation, remember when Chrysler got bailed out in the 70s? Lee Iacocca. Remember, remember that? Lee Iacocca. What a corporate genius. Oh, they would be on the cover of Time magazine. Lee Iacocca took Chrysler. It was at the edge of going over and he brought it back. He didn't bring it back. I know who brought Chrysler back. I'm looking at the people who brought Chrysler back right now. The U.S. taxpayers, that's who brought it back. He got all these Pentagon contracts and he started making tanks for the Pentagon and this for the Pentagon. Cut back, the unions had to swallow all the losses, take all the pain, and that's how he, he made Chrysler solvent again. And he was, he was applauded as some kind of a genius. Public sector services are not something that the plutocrats like. Public sector services create jobs, they bring in revenues, they serve human needs, they carry out productive tasks, and yet the plutocracy doesn't make a penny in profit. They are not for-profit services. Not-for-profit should, uh, should be forbidden, uh, if the, as the plutocrats would see it. The plutocrats are also good at stepping all over those who can't defend themselves, the low income, the disabled. And another thing that can't defend itself is the environment. And they're really good at uh, plundering the environment. In fact, these guys believe that whatever is left of our natural resources are theirs to have when they want, to do what they want with it, to maximize their profits on terms that they define. Okay, when this wealth goes abroad and when you begin to take over other countries and you begin to put these countries under a kind of receivership and you begin to talk about regime change and you begin to talk about the need to build uh, institutions and teach these lesser peoples the, the blessings of democracy and such. I mean, in Iraq, Iraq had a democratic revolution in 1958 and they nationalized their oil industry and they were starting all sorts of wonderful democratic programs they didn't need they don't need any they don't need any guidance in how to and, and how to how to self govern what's left out is that the US and the CIA backing Saddam Hussein went in there and destroyed Saddam Hussein went in there and tortured and murdered or drove into exile or underground every democrat every communist every progressive every reformer every constitutionalist that it lived in Iraq and when he was doing those things in his worst years in his worst years, he was Washington's poster boy. They loved him. They couldn't do enough for him. It's only when he got out of line on the oil prices. It's only when he didn't hand all that oil back over to the British and uh, U.S. companies that the 58 revolution had kicked out. It's only when he started self-developing and training cadres of Iraqi engineers and talking about Iraq for the Iraqis and Iraq developed the highest standard of living in the Middle East, that's when they went after him. He was a bad example. So this empire that we build, this empire feeds off the republic, as all empires do. And you can see that today. I go all around this country lecturing just in the past five or six months. I must tell you, when I pick up the local newspapers, it often looks like I'm in the same place. Every place has the same story. City council, uh, city council facing budget cuts. State with a heavy debt. Blah, blah, blah. Cuts, cuts, cuts. Services being cut back. This, that, and the other thing. The republic has to do with less so that the empire can uh, uh, feed itself. $280 billion for Iraq and for Halliburton and Bechtel and the, and the 70 other companies that are there. Uh, much of that money unaccountable unsupervised, and meanwhile, drastic cuts here. So the, uh, the center bleeds while the periphery expands. Athens is starved so that Sparta can, can glisten with its swords in the sun. But there exists not only class oppression, but class struggle. The many fight back against the few. Democracy Democracy, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, democracy is a wonderful invention by the people of history to defend themselves against the abuses of wealth. That's what democracy was 
in ancient Athens. That's what democracy was in the Roman Republic. In my book, The Assassination of Julius Caesar, I talk about the constant struggle that went on between the tribal assemblies and popular leaders like the Gracchi and Caesar and these people as against the aristocrats in the Roman Senate. Uh, a constant struggle that went on. It was democracy against plutocracy. The many fight back against the few. George Bush summed it up in his inimitable way. He said, it sure would be a lot easier to govern if this was a dictatorship, unquote. <laughs> oh, from the mouths of babes come utterances of truth. But democracy is more than its electoral and representational procedures. It also has a substance and a content. People just don't fight for the vote as an abstraction. They fight for the vote because they want something. When white male workers in the 1820s fought to get franchise and fought to get rid of property qualifications, they weren't doing this simply because their civics lessons in school told them it's good to vote and you'd be a better citizen. They didn't go to school. They didn't hear that kind of stuff. They fought for it because they wanted a better living wage. To get a better living wage, they needed to develop combinations, as they were called then, or what we would call unions. To get the unions, they had to change the laws that made such combinations illegal. To change those laws, they had to change the office holders. To change the office holders, they had to get at the state that was on their neck. They had to get into that political process. To get into that political process, they had to change the rules that were excluding them from that process. And that's the same struggle that African Americans went through. It's the same struggle that women went through. When women started their movements in the 19th century for the, for the franchise, it wasn't some gender ego which said, you men have the vote, so we should have the vote. It wasn't abstracted. It was in a social context where women couldn't own property, where women were, were consigned to the worst, lowest, rotten-paying jobs, where they had no protections of person, where they had all sorts of struggles. You know what those struggles are, because many of them are still going on right to this day. But So the fight, the expansion for, of procedural democracy is also part of the fight for substantive democracy. It's not only should be government by the people, it should be government for the people. The payoffs, the end policy, what's the good of us electing Well, I had to hook up my mic. Little technical details, but uh, we'll be back next Saturday, same time. With any luck, we'll all be in good spirits. And uh, now, how do you like this instant uh, studio inside the control room trick? Well, I liked it. So, uh, with any luck, I'll try to have this uploaded to YouTube tonight, if not sometime this weekend. And... I guess we're going to be out.